Now, you're sitting here and you're looking at these incredible pieces of work, and uh, I'm supposed to talk about this guy, but I think these images probably say more than anything I can say because he's an incredibly talented um, man. So Joe Sacco is a Portland-based, he calls himself a cartoonist. I asked him, like, are you a journalist? Are you a cartoonist? Are you a like, graphic novelist? But they're not really novels. And he kind of laughed and he says, well, you can call me a cartoonist, but I think he's also a foreign correspondent and he does groundbreaking work uh, now also about history. So his newest book, The Great War, July 1st, 1916, the first day of the Battle of the Somme, which was the, the largest battle of the First World War, and we're coming up in 1914 on the anniversary of that war. Um, uh, so it'll be interesting to hear what he has to say. You can see some of the images have been flashed up there. He's best known perhaps for his books on Palestine, including Palestine, a nation occupied Palestine in the Gaza Strip. And for that, he won an American Book Award, which is not easy to obtain. Um, he's also done some very impressive work about the Balkans. And uh, that's an area we were talking backstage, you know, where suddenly, out of nowhere, neighbors started killing one another. And he was in the Balkans. Uh, that's where he met Chris Hedges, with whom he's also written a book about um, uh, kind of inequality in America. So you can see this man has touched on many different themes in his working life. And his book uh, was Garajda, the War in Eastern Bosnia. Um, he's a very humble man. He, he likes to call himself a long-suffering working stiff. Uh, I, I would suggest that uh, when you win a Guggenheim <laughs> Fellowship that you're maybe, you could use a little more florid language. Um, but anyway, I've probably said enough. I'll introduce, um, we're going to have Joe Sacco, but with him is Chris Brayshaw, who's a writer, photographer, great guy, and you can often see him behind the counter at Pulp Fiction, extremely knowledgeable about cartooning, which I'm glad he's here for that reason as well as his uh, intellect. So with no further ado, I'll introduce Joe Sacco and Chris Brayshaw. Okay, so we'll just take turns asking questions and chatting with Joe, and then we'll offer some opportunity for, for people in the audience to ask questions. I think I'll start, Joe, by asking, you know, you've done a lot of contemporary uh, reporting and with your cartooning. I'm curious why you decided to look at the First World War. Okay, uh, thanks for uh, coming out and uh, for the generous introduction and all that. Thank you for being here. Um, it wasn't really my idea. Uh, what happened is uh, a guy named Matt Weiland, who I was living with uh, in the 1990s in New York City, um, when we were living together, um, it was some drunken night, we were playing darts, and he was interested in the First World War, and he knew I was. And he said, wouldn't it be great if you drew a panorama of the, of the Western Front during the war? And his model for it was uh, something by a guy named Matteo uh, Pericoli called Manhattan Unfurled, which is like an accordion fold-out of the skyline of Manhattan. It's an amazing book. But, you know, I sort of said, sure, that's a great idea. And then I got on, got on, got on with my life. And about 15 years later, he called up. Now he's, he was an editor at W.W. W. Norton. And he said, remember that idea we talked about you, you drawing the First World War? And I said, yeah, what about it? And he said, do you want to do that? And uh, my first reaction was no, uh, because I had other plans. But I thought about it. And the truth is I've spent... Um, a lot of time thinking about the First World War. 
I've been, um, you know, I grew up in Australia, so another Commonwealth country, and there. Anzac Day, the day that the Australians, New Zealanders, some French and British troops also landed at Gallipoli, really figures into the national consciousness. Uh, so I grew up with all the commemorations of that. And I, was, I used to read about it when I was a boy. And I was kind of fascinated in that way that boys are by things like gas masks and, you know, biplanes and. And when I began to read about it, I mean, it was it kind of it was attractive because it was weird, but it was also repellent. Uh, phrases like "no man's land," which, as a boy, you take really literally. What does that really mean? That no man can enter that land. Uh, and so, over the years, I found myself reading more about it. And when I was in my late twenties, I actually visited the Somme battlefield and uh, Flanders battlefields and just walked among the graves for about four or five days, just reading, reading headstones. Uh, so it's sort of, it's been present in my life. And finally I thought, okay, here's this offer to do this. Maybe I should redeem that boy with those weird interests. And um, it's got sort of a penance I decided to draw it. Okay. The panorama is not a super modern form. It's very different from the montage or collage effects that uh, you use in the course of producing, a, say, a graphic novel. Can you talk a little bit about how you actually went about structuring the panorama and particularly what kind of research that might have involved? The First World War is distant to us in a way that, say, like, you know, present day Egypt or Eastern Europe isn't, just for, you know, simple things like visual reference. Well, what I did is, uh, um, there were a few things I did. You know, I looked at my books and I saw the photographs I had and I, I knew that wasn't enough. So I went to London, I went to the Imperial War Museum and spent some time in their photo archive just going through and finding photographs of details. I mean, little things you wouldn't really see in most picture, even picture books of the, of the First World War. And I collected that. Uh, I sat with a uh, World War I historian named Julian Petkowski just to go over all those things I didn't understand about the mechanics of going over the top, for example. And, um, you know, there are no photographs really of battle itself from the First World War. I mean, most of the photographs are by official artists, uh, official war photographers, and um, it was not practical probably to go over with a camera, which were heavy. Uh, but beyond that, you, you didn't want to, I mean, an official war photographer is going to be careful about what he's taking a picture of. So a lot of the imagery of that I got, I got from reading books. Uh, Martin Middlebrook's First Day on the Psalm, Lynn MacDonald's book, Psalm. There were many. And uh, you read those first-person accounts. And I mean, that's the power of prose. When you're reading prose, you get images in your head. So I had this idea, well, I'll just translate these images into, or these images in my head, onto paper. So all that sort of thing. Plus, you know, you can go to YouTube and look up certain howitzers. This is really technical. Because I didn't understand a lot of this stuff. It's like uh, you can look at a picture of it, but you don't understand how it works. Like how far does the barrel go back? And what do the, when it fires, and where do the artillerymen, what do they do? So you, there's old footage, and you can freeze the frame on YouTube, and you know, you figure out what everyone's doing. So there was a lot of research, i got to say, yeah. The images also convey a lot of emotion, or at least leave people with a feeling of emotion. Um, do you go about seeking to elicit emotions or feelings from people when they look at these? No, I'm, I'm not trying to elicit their emotions. I mean, really... When I'm drawing, I'm thinking about myself and what I'm getting out of it, to be honest. Um, I'm thinking about what I'm drawing. If I'm drawing troops going up to the front enthusiastically, I mean, the great thing about drawing is it takes time, so you have the luxury of contemplating people going off to a war enthusiastically. I'm not trying to play on people's emotions, especially in, the fir in this First World War panorama. It's very different from my other work, where I'll often, you know, introduce the reader to someone I met and make it a very personal story. In this, in this particular thing, I almost thought, 
I want to I want to approach this as almost like I'm an alien looking at the human race going through its you know going about its business on July 1st 1916 and that was its business on that day I mean it's 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 down at an angle where it's a bit it's just a bit above the action it's um, somewhat disinterested I'm not trying to make any comment I, I might have opinions but I'm not trying to make any commentary about the bundle the bungling of the high command the bravery of the soldiers, nothing like that. It's as if you're an alien sort of looking at what's going on. That's how I approached it. One characteristic both of the panorama and your work in general is this, this I guess I call it like a sense of teeming aliveness where it's often a very kind of deep focus, like the world seems to extend way far back and characters who are like maybe peripheral to the main action that's being depicted are just as important. That seems to me a quality that lends itself to rereading your work. There's always like new details emerging from the, the largest panoramas. But it's also something I associate with a style of cartooning pioneered by, say, somebody like uh, Harvey Kurtzman and Will Elder on Mad Magazine, where there's millions of little in-jokes and millions of complicated little things buried in the frame that are designed not to be picked up on a like on a first reading, but only on a second or a third or a tenth. Do you think about kind of embedding those layers of meaning in the work as, as you work? And, and if so, was Elder and Kurtzman's work some sort of influence on you? Well, it really was. I mean, uh, not so much Kurtzman as Elder, just his drawing style. If you're not familiar with Will Elder, uh, he was a, before Mad Magazine, there was Mad Comics. And um, what was really, he, he did outrageously funny drawings and there was a script where something was going on in the foreground, but usually it was sort of subverted by what was going on in the background, where there were all these little jokes. And the, the foreground almost didn't matter as much as the mayhem in the background. I mean, you know, even the main characters would be, their paths would be changing from panel to panel. All kinds of things were going on, and I was really influenced by that. And my first comics were funny, or I thought they were funny, and I was really influenced <laughs> by Will Elder. So uh, that you, you really picked up on something. But the idea of detail, um, that's where I sort of got it from, was from Elder. And that detail, you know, over the years translated in my work to journalistic detail. And the, the knowledge that whatever's going on in the foreground, you can use the background to get a lot of information across. And the thing about comics is with repeated panels, you can, the background, even if it remains the same, um, it, it's sort of something will carry over, background information carries over. For example, if you're in a Palestinian refugee camp back in the 1990s, there was a lot of graffiti, and the Israeli soldiers would make the Palestinians paint over the graffiti. So there'd be um, obscured graffiti all over the walls. So if I'm having a conversation in, in one of the comics with someone, and we're walking down the street, in the background you're seeing that all the time. So it's one of those characteristics that just stays with the reader the whole time and really sinks in. And that's where, you know, I, I credit Elder, I think, to that sort of, for that sort of thing. And then just the, busy, the busyness, yeah. I mean, with that World War I panorama, I, I also thought of uh, medieval uh, artwork. Also, it's a big influence. And I sort of gave my, myself the freedom to think in terms of how artists in the Middle Ages did, where perspective didn't matter as much. You know, things were compressed. An inch could mean an, a mile. I didn't draw the thing to scale. And it was liberating. And it just gave it this claustrophobic feeling that I think is probably more true to the reality. What, what attracted you to going to the Balkans? Sort of a compulsion. Um, I was really uh, upset by what was going on there. Um, you know, maybe it sounds trite, but that whole phrase, never again, that, that had resonated with me. And it's not that things weren't going on around the world, but, you know, I was born in Europe, so that, that it was going on in Europe um, had an effect on me. Um, and at some point, I thought, I just have to go and see this for myself. And um, once I make that decision in my head, I just have to go. I mean, I know... That's where I begin, the wheels begin to sort of um, turn 
And I know that if I don't do that, I'd, I would really regret it. And why Garajda? Well, Garajda was a, Garajda was a place that, um, you know, I, I went to Sarajevo at first, and Sarajevo was a little frustrating. I mean, there were some interesting stories there, but by the time I got there, which was late 1995, toward the end of the war, people were really fed up with foreign correspondence. I mean, they were relatively kind to me because I was a cartoonist, and they sort of said, oh, he's a cartoonist, you're okay. But people had told their stories and were, or were fed up with the foreign presence. Uh, Garage, on the other hand, when I, when I got to Bosnia, was still under siege. It was surrounded by the Bosnian Serbs, heavily shelled, a lot of deprivation. And while I was there, it opened up in the sense that UN convoys could get in. It didn't mean that people could get out. But I had managed to get a press card, so by virtue of the this little blue card, I could get on a convoy and go. And at first I thought I'll just, every, every journalist was going to Garage because it had just opened up and they were staying for the afternoon. And I sort of didn't want to be part of that pack. So about two or three weeks later, I went just to have a look. And I just fell in love with the place. I mean, you'd be walking down the street and this is a place that hadn't seen foreigners. Um, people would be inviting you into their homes. And for the first time, they got sugar on the convoy, so they were making cakes and, you know, come in, try my cake, you know. Was, and, and they were telling their stories. And it was just, um, it was kind of a beautiful moment in a way. And I, just, I was just captivated by it. And it was clear to me that this is a, a place that hasn't told its story yet. So I thought this is a good place to put down the anchor. Tell me a little bit about the... Tell us a little bit about the, the work process that gets from an individual narrating their story, individual, therefore deeply subjective to you, an outsider, both historically and culturally. How do you take, how do you take that story and change it in, in, in such a way that it opens up onto like broader narratives beyond like, you know, whatever the individual's experience is? Well, often, um, you know, you listen to stories and you've, you, like when I was in Garajda, for example, you, you talk to one, two, three people and you begin to get an idea of what happened in the town. And then you begin to fill the details in and you realize that certain people's stories can fill in for the larger story in a way. Uh, I met a guy named Eden, I mean almost right away, and he had sort of been in Garajda at the Central Times, he'd been involved in the fighting uh, he had been, he had gone over the mountains like many had to reach a point where food was being distributed. They had to go through enemy lines in the snow in the winter, and a lot of people died on these trips. He um, had gone to um, collect food from parachute drops when uh, NATO was dropping food onto the enclave. So through him, I could tell the bigger picture. But I was always interested in personalizing it, because you can tell the story of Garage without talking about individuals, but that's not how I want to hear a story. So I expect that most people want to hear a story through the eyes of those who lived it. And that's kind of how I approach it, is who can sort of fill in parts of a story. Sometimes he couldn't fill in the whole story, then you, you meet someone else who can tell you another aspect of that story. Now, are there points at which those various subjective stories become internally inconsistent or contradict one another? And at that point, I mean, a journalist would fact check a story. You know, you, you work as a journalist, but there is a subjective element in the work as well. Do you have to confront people on the, on the veracity of the stories they're relating to you? If so, does that cause you conflict in the community? Well, you have to, you know, you have to make sure that um, the story is true by asking other people. And, you know, usually what I've found is people have the general, generally the same story. I did a book called Footnotes in Gaza um, where uh, people told me the story of uh, certain incidents that happened in 1956. Um, in one case, um, this was during the Suez Crisis, Israel occupied Gaza for a few months and they were trying to screen the Palestinian population for guerrillas. And so they would 
they had the men gather in a school uh, by loudspeaker. They called on all military age, let's say 16 and over, to go to the school. And they, the men were beaten, some were shot, and, but most just spent the time in the school and then were screened. So I asked many old, older men, now in their late 60s, 70s, and 80s, what had happened on that day. And what you find is, yes, there are contradictions, but the, the overall arc of the story is, is correct. All of them, almost all of them heard the loudspeakers. They all remember running to the school. They remember, a lot of them remember specific details that were, you know, shoes lying on the ground on the way to the school, because people lose their shoes when they're running, being beaten at the gate. And then it gets very mixed up when they're spending 10 hours being screened. That's when their memory gets fuzzy. I mean, I was, I was with a, uh, a group of graduate students today, and uh, they were asking about memory and all this sort of thing. And what was interesting is everyone remembers a very sharp thing, like being beaten over the head as they were entering the school. But not everyone can remember the details of 10 hours waiting to be screened, what happened first in what order. And I was confronted with all these contradictions about what happened when they were in the school. And I decided to basically throw that back at the reader. This is, I mean, I've always tried to be transparent about getting a story and about the problems in getting a story. But, but the actual, the important part is the overall story arc is the same. Okay, they, they get it mixed up what happened in the school. Some people don't remember the Jeep being there. Some people don't remember this guy being called to the front. But the general drift is the same. And contradictions, I think, are natural after 50 years. I mean, there's a problem with testimony after 50 years. In uh, recent years, we've seen a lot of um, criticism of Israel in the um, Western media. Uh, we're seeing more of it. But back when you were doing, you know, Palestine, a nation occupied, or Palestine in the Gaza Strip, uh, wasn't much of that in in North America, North American media. And I'm wondering um, that. Uh, what did you see there that maybe a lot of other um, foreign correspondents or media outlets didn't see? Well, I guess you have to go back to the genesis of um, my interest in, in the region. And something you should know is I, I studied journalism. I got a degree in journalism. Um, and I graduated from school relatively left of center, knowing a lot about what was going on in Central America. Um, but basically, my impression of Palestinians was that they were terrorists. And I realized, uh, my mind began to change, or let, let's say I began to question that um, in 1982 and 1981, when um, there were air attacks on Beirut, um, by the Israelis, and then these Israel invaded Lebanon, and there was the massacre at Sabra and Shatila in Beirut, where uh, Christian allies of the Israelis went in and killed, I mean, hundreds to up to a, you know, a couple of thousand, it's, the, the numbers aren't exactly clear, Palestinians. That's when I thought, well, what's going on here? I thought the Palestinians were the terrorists. And that began to make me just question it. It then it took a lot of time to self-educate myself. That was reading books and spending some time in Europe where people have a more nuanced approach. And at some point, I began to realize that journalism and the way I'd studied journalism, which was this American ideal of objective journalism, had really given me a, um, a skewed idea of what was going on. And you, what, you, what I began to realize is journalists can present you with the objective facts. There was a car, there was a, uh, a bus bombed and Israeli civilians were killed, an objective fact. Katusha rockets landed on an Israeli kibbutz, an objective fact. But if those are the only objective facts you're getting, it's going to give you a skewed idea. And I realized the only time I ever heard the word Palestinian was when terrorist was also used. 
And so that made me wonder, what wasn't I learning? What was the backstory? What else is going on? It doesn't mean those objective facts aren't true, but objective facts without a context, without the whole story, is going to give you a, a, an improper idea of what's going on. And my idea when I went wasn't, I was unclear what I was going to do there. Um, I had, um, I came out of this uh, tradition of um, first person uh, autobiographical comics, and my first idea was, okay, I want to see what's going on there. I'll do a series of comics about what, what I find, but ultimately it's about my adventures in the Middle East. But when I got there, my journalistic training sort of took over, and I found myself interviewing people, taking notes, looking to fill in the picture of what life was like in the occupation. And so then I realized what I'm really trying to do is just, just get these voices across, whether um, they were angry voices, um, intelligent voices or not. Just let these people speak. And, you know, let's, I want to find out what they have to say. And that's kind of how I approach the subject. Now, at, at, at the time, your autobiographical comics uh, published by Fanographics, which were really awesome, but which I, we were discussing in the green room as probably being toward the low end of, of, of profitability. Um, <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> um, what was the critical reception of voices that at that point might not have been widely available to uh, US mainstream media consumers and uh, underground and autobiographical comic book consumers in particular like? At some point, you became critically acclaimed, quotation marks, but it sure didn't happen overnight. No, the quotation marks took a long time to get there. <laughs> um, well, you know, uh, when I started doing all this stuff, the graphic novel didn't exist as we think of it today. It was comics, what now, are, what I still call comic books, what people now call the floppy existed. And um, pal the, the book that became Palestine was a series of nine comic books. And... The beauty of it was no one was paying attention, and it was selling in such low numbers. Um, I mean, it was really disheartening to get the, the sales figures. It was going down every issue. <laughs> now, now, part of this, you know, I, I, I have to say has to do with the nature of how uh, comics were sold at the time, only in comic book shops, which, as you know, um, mostly it was superheroes that were being sold. The sort of independent alternative comics was really the ghetto within a comic book shop, if it even existed in the comic book shop. So the numbers were so low that, you know, Fanographics, my publisher, should have probably canceled it. It was like under 2,000 um, when the series wrapped up, which is really low for, you know, North America. Um, but the good thing about that was it, it was under the radar. And when you're under the radar, you just do what you want because no one's paying attention. And so you can establish your voice without, I mean, I didn't have some large contingent of uh, politically minded uh, people who were just yelling at me because they thought I was an anti-Semite or I'm against Israel or something like that. I could sort of find my voice without a lot of noise in my head. And I'm glad for that because I was younger then and you never know how you're gonna respond to that sort of thing. Uh, now the criticism doesn't matter in that same way that it might have then. So that's that's that story, I guess. <laughs> my my guess, Joe, is your fans are sitting here wondering, why don't we see your eyes in your cartoons? Well, you get to see them in real life, so. Uh, um, oh, you know, it's just it's just that sort of notion, and it's a bit hokey to me now that I I've I've, I've kind of answered this question a lot. It sounds hokey, but you know the eyes are the windows to the soul. And as much as you're seeing me, and I'm not trying to, I try to show myself as as I feel I am uh, in these situations. But you're not seeing the full me. You're not seeing all my emotions, and that's a clue to the reader that I'm not showing everything about you know any inner turmoil I might be having or whatever it is. It's just not. 
that important for the story. There's enough of me in a lot of my work anyway. Maybe too much, some will say. I was super impressed with your um, collaboration with Chris Hedges. Um, it reminded me very much of a very beautiful earlier book by uh, the writer James Agee and the photographer Walker Evans, uh, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. Um, I'm curious about the genesis of your book. Um, I'm curious as to how long you and Chris traveled together, how you divided up uh, interview subjects between the two of you, um, in particular, how you decided what information was conveyed as prose and what information was conveyed as either illustrations to that prose or as full-on comics. Well, Chris Hedges um, was a uh, New York Times correspondent, and we met in Bosnia. Well, uh, the story of how we met is kind of funny. I'll, I'll tell it briefly. Um, there was a there was a time when the the Bosnian Serbs basically disallowed convoys getting into Garajda, and I desperately wanted to get back. And finally, the French were allowing me on one of their convoys, and you know you had to be at the site to get on the convoy like 5:30 in the morning. And I realized that I was there, and the convoy was ready to go, but they were holding it up. And they were holding it up because the New York Times correspondent was supposed to come and was late. And I thought, boy, they wouldn't have held it up for the cartoonist. Yeah. <laughs> so I was, I was a little miffed. But he got, in, he got into the, uh, the vehicle I was in, and we just hit it off, uh, just talking about literature and all that sort of stuff. So we became really good friends. And then he left the New York Times. Um, he had some disputes with the Times. And you know we kind of have the same worldview in a lot of ways, uh, and we did some. We went and we did some work in Gaza, and we found we worked pretty well together. Um, then he was we, he was on some book tour and he was in Portland and we were sitting down for a drink, getting ourselves worked up about the state of America, and it was like okay let's do a book about it. And that's just sort of how that those things begin. They usually begin with a drink, like my, like the World War One book did. <laughs> So put a drink in front of me, and I'll probably come up with a book. <laughs> um, but, you know, we traveled to four places in America. We made more than a couple of trips to some of them. We spent 10 days to a week in each place. Uh, I mean, each trip was about 10 days to a week. Um, he was going to do most of the writing, so uh, he was sort of the lead with the, with the questions though I would interject questions. And there was no sort of ownership about, you know, I'm doing this and you do that. It, was, it wasn't like that. It was more like, oh, this story seems really good uh, for, to tell graphically. Maybe you can do the story. And we, we, without really planning it, we, we quickly realized I would tell a personal story of one of the people uh, in each section. That sort of developed very naturally. But he's great to work with because, first of all, he's a really, really smart guy. He's fun to drive around with and just pick his brain. And, um, you know, it's just great watching a great reporter working. I mean, I learned something. You've encountered a lot of despair over the years um, in the Middle East, in, in Bosnia. And, and then you encountered it across America. And I'm curious how you would compare the level of despair or desperation in America to what you've seen in these kind of war zones? Well, I mean, every place is different, and it's hard to compare on some level. But parts of the United States are like the third world. And I mean, if you're driving through West Virginia, through some of these towns that were, are famous in in terms of union history, the, you know, the coal mining and the unions that developed and the great struggle uh, for wages and uh, good working conditions, safe working conditions. You, you go, you're going through some of these towns and every other home is collapsed, just abandoned homes, collapsed with the weight of the snow in the winters. And Chris and I looked at each other and, and said, this is like Bosnia without the minarets. I mean, it. it felt like that. And if you're in a place like Camden, New Jersey, where there are so many abandoned homes, um, you know, a, a place that used to have shipyards, 
Campbell's Soup, RCA, and now you know one of the most crime-ridden places in the United States, incredible poverty level. It's very disheartening, and there's a lot of despair, and in some cases, a lot of resignation. And what sort of struck me the most is that people seem to self-medicate. I mean, you realize alcohol, painkillers, and drugs are what gets people through, or it's religion. I mean, I'm not one of those people who, I'm not, I'm an atheist, but um, I don't, I don't, people who believe, it, it doesn't bother me if, if, if that is what you need and that's what gives you strength, because a lot of the people who are religious seem to have a certain strength and conviction. And um, yeah, but I mean, it, it's very disheartening. I mean, living in Portland, Oregon, uh, you're in a bubble. Living on the coasts, you're in a bubble. Probably living in Vancouver, you're in a bubble. And, and actually, there are spots within the city that are not in a bubble. I mean, once you're in the street, you it's see like people a block are in the away street. From here. Mm -hmm. What's that? Like a block away from here. Yeah, exactly. So I was sort of, I was shocked. I've spent, you know, most of my work has been overseas. And I've, I've done work in India, and I've seen, you know, this sort of poverty and not just poverty, but hunger, that, you know, you don't really find, you, 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 fell, you find malnutrition in America, but not that, that sort of hunger, but still, it's, um, I mean, it's, fr frankly, it's shameful. NATO isn't running sugar into Camden, New Jersey, or the mountains of West Virginia. How do you gain the trust of a community that's basically had, like, you know, the rest of the world's turned its back on it in order to start to achieve the level of, like, closeness to your subjects that you need in order that people open up and start talking to you? Do you prepare? Do you... You mean in general? Yeah, before you, before you arrive. I assume you just don't, like, you know, roll up in the car and, you know, bound out with a tape recorder and a notebook. Actually, sometimes you do. Um, I mean, you prepare, you read as much as you can, but you realize that reading um, brings you up to about 10% of what you need. But that 10% is crucial. You need to know, uh, you need to have a certain base level. But, for example, when I first went to the Pal uh, Palestine, um, I sort of knew the basic basically what was going on between the Israelis and the Palestinians. What I didn't understand what was going on between the Palestinians. I mean, I would read about that, but sort of skim over it. But when you get there, you realize, oh, I, gotta, I have to learn about the Popular Front and, you know, the DLP or whatever it is and the PLO. I, I, I mean, I knew, I knew the PLO, of course, and I knew about that organization. But the other faction, the factions um, within it, I had to begin to understand what they were about. So you learn a lot. Now, there, I sort of practiced what I called random journalism, where I literally would get into a, a uh, shared taxi that was going to a place I'd never been before. And you wait for the taxi to fill up, and then it leaves Jerusalem to wherever it's going, you know, um, Nablus or Janine or someplace. And I would get out in uh, the square, you know, where the taxi stops, and I could just basically trust that within minutes, someone would come up to me and say, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And I would just rely on that because I'd say, I'm here to see how you're living. And at that time, it was very possible for someone just to say, and normally it did happen, come with me, I'll show you something. You want to see how we live? Let me, let me take you somewhere. So I really relied. And if you read Palestine, it's very episodic uh, uh, for that reason. You know, things changed. By the time when I was reporting uh, the book Footnotes in Gaza, the second intifada, people were a little less trusting. So I approached it very differently. And I had to because I was going to spend time in places that I didn't know, uh, southern Gaza Strip. And um, what I did is I, I, through someone who knew someone, I met a guy who was trusted in the community. He was known. And also his family was respected, because you have to sort of know how the, what's considered um, appropriate, who's considered appropriate, that sort of thing. 
and he could speak relatively good English. And he was my guide. He became my guide. And basically, if, if I was with him, everything was fine because he was trusted. He was completely trusted. So through him, you know, what happens is, you know, you go to, you go to going to Rafa, it's like the first question you ask is, okay, who's, who should I see on the street that's actually in control? You don't really go to see the mayor. You might make a courtesy call, but it's like, who's, in, who's really in charge? Mm -hmm. And then you just go and you have, it's a social visit. You don't really know who it is in this room that is kind of the guy, but people come and go, they, they meet you. And you just let them know, you know, I'm here to do some research about this. And then they leave you alone. In fact, they start visiting you and talking to you. And then after a while, they befriend you. So, I mean, there are different ways of doing it, but that's the way I, I did it the most recently. Mm -hmm. And what are the biggest misconceptions about the Palestinians after all of your time spent with them, say, in North America? What are the biggest misconceptions? Yeah. Boy, I mean, I just say they're a complicated people, like every, you know, like we all are. It's, I, what I learned is, you know, they're not terrorists with a capital T, and they're not victim with a capital V. I mean, um, they span a lot of. There, there are a lot of things going on in the community and with the people. So there's, there's no way to generalize, really. I mean, that's that seems relatively obvious, but that, I, that's basically it. I. The thing I try to show, I try to be honest about what I was hearing, because sometimes I might be sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, but I'm not an activist, so I'm not thinking in terms of, oh, I, I'm going to obscure this because it, it'll make them look bad. To me, I mean, I'm trying to be honest, as honest as possible, and the idea is show, show people in any situation wart, warts and all. That, I mean, they're human, after all. They're not angels. So, you know, just show what I saw. That's, that's kind of how I looked at it. What criteria do you use to judge the success or failure of your own work? I'm thinking of two examples in particular. Uh, one, there's a, there's a short piece in, uh, in the journalism collection about being at the uh, International War uh, Criminal Tribunals on The Hague and saying, well you're really harsh in your notes on that piece, saying, well, that <clears throat> the piece didn't work because I wanted to end with, uh, you know, Louise Arbor and another jurist. They weren't willing to, you know, commit themselves on record on the basis of, like, it was going to get published in Details magazine, and they didn't think Details was a culturally significant, you know, outlet to, um, to speak with. There's another piece in the same collection where you basically get chased out of a small village in India, and that journalistic assignment kind of ends in failure too, except, it's, except you're being chased out seems to kind of actually show how that, your, your failure shows how that place really is in, a, I think, a very successful and interesting way. Yeah, well, sometimes you've got to use your failure. I mean, normally what I like to do is go to one place and stay for as long as possible. And <clears throat> in this case, it was a small hamlet in a village in... Um, Uttar Pradesh, and um, I was talking to um, Dalits. I was talking to Mus uh, Musahars, which are the a very in the hierarchy of Dalits, uh, the, un the the so-called untouchables. They're they're considered low even among other untouchables. So um, I was spending time with them, but people of a higher caste uh, didn't like that. They didn't. They don't like people to know what's actually going on, the level of poverty. Um, so yeah, we were chased out after maybe two or three days visit. Uh, visit. And it was clear that if we insisted, we're just gonna call, we were going to cause trouble for the people we were talking to. You don't want people to be in danger because we want to get a story. But we basically just decided, I, I was uh, with uh, a guide, that, okay, let's just go to a number of villages and see what happens. And so we just began hitting a number of villages. It, it's not the way I normally do a story, but it, it seemed necessary at that moment. With the war crimes tribunal story, yeah, I was very disappointed because um, I'd done the work like any other journalist there, but um, the 
chief prosecutor and the president of the tribunal, uh, I, I had scheduled interviews with them. And then I was called into a conference room where they were both sitting and they wanted to pour over what details was like, details of the magazine, like showing me pictures of you know, semi-clad women. And I, you know, I was thinking, well, Italian journalists are here. <laughs> Have you ever seen an Italian magazine? <laughs> you know, but they weren't having it. And you know, I suspect that they didn't like the fact that I was doing comics, though I, I sort of said, is that the reason? And they said, no. But they had my work in front of, they actually had my comics in front of them. And that's what I really suspect. But you know what? It, it, it made the story lesser for it. Because I wanted them to say, why was the tribunal important? I admire these women. I admire what they've done. I, I admire the tribunal. I mean, I, I think it has a lot of problems. But ultimately, it's a positive thing. And it's a shame that I had to sort of come up with those statements at the end. That's not what a journalist should be doing. I'm curious, Joe, if there are people in the audience or in Vancouver who look at your work and they say, I want to travel the world, I want to deal with injustice, I want to do cartoon, cartooning, and I want to bring characters to life. I basically want to do what Joe Sacco has done. Don't what, do it, I want no competition. What, <laughs> what, what advice do you have for them based on what you know now that you might not have known when you started? I think it's an advice to anyone who wants to be in the journalism field, really. I mean, don't expect someone to knight you as a foreign correspondent and to send you anywhere. You've got to do it yourself. I mean, the people, I, I, met, other, I met other journalists, even in Sarajevo, at the end of the war, and a lot of them came on their own steam. And you, you found work if you came on your own steam. Um, it was better, because to work your way up through the ranks, um, that's no guarantee. If, if I had waited for someone to notice me and to, to go the traditional way, I'm not sure it ever would have happened. I mean, I went because I wanted to go, and I scrounged together to money to go, and that can be done by anyone, really. Chris? Your work is handmade to a, to my eyes, almost unbelievable extent, like the level of detail. And I think about the amount of time it must like physically, you know, sit using analog means. Do you, many other cartoonists use computers to do lettering, they use computers to do backgrounds, they use all kinds of like digital assistants. Are you, are you strictly an analog guy? And if so, is that a ideological choice? Or, well, it's one of, I enjoy the, the pleasure of drawing. I mean, um, don't underestimate the joy of opening up a tin of ink or something and <laughs> dipping a pen into it and smelling the ink and, and scratching, feeling the scratching on the board. I mean, I know you can do, maybe the idea is the thing. And I know you can do things with computers that can get the si same idea across that I'm getting across, um, but I don't really enjoy sitting in front of a computer screen. I do enjoy drawing. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wouldn't do it if I didn't enjoy drawing. Um, I only got a scanner about two years ago because I began to worry about sending things in the mail. I was losing things here and there, and I was thinking, I, I can't send my originals around anymore. Um, and I don't know how to use Photoshop. And actually, I would like to learn how to use Photoshop, so don't get me wrong, I think there are things you can do with a computer that are useful that are gonna be done by a computer, in, with a computer by someone else, because you're not doing it. Mm -hmm. So I should learn those things. But ultimately, you know, I mean, that's just, I don't even, even the word analog seems weird to me, because th that, that implies digital or whatever, and uh, drawing is an analog to me. Analog sounds like it's the counterpart, it's like some sort of opposite of digital, but to me it's drawing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, Joe, after all you've done, uh, you still have your passion for what you're doing. Uh, what projects do you have underway right now, or what are you contemplating taking on? I'm working on a uh, semi-pornographic uh, satire, um, which I'm really enjoying. Uh, then there's some uh, long, 
long-term projects. Uh, the, the main one is um, I'm, I'm doing a project about ancient Mesopotamia because I've begun, I, be, I became interested in um, social inequality. I mean, you can see from my work and hierarchy. Um, and uh, I'd like, to, I'm curious how it all got going. So uh, what I've been doing long term is uh, interviewing archaeologists, what they understand about how first civilizations developed and how those things, inequality and hierarchy developed. So that's, that's a long term project. Does this involve trips to Iraq? Um, I would like that to happen. Yeah. The, um, can you talk a little more about the, the idea of the origin of inequality? One thing we were uh, talking about prior to coming out was the idea that if you work away at like a number of projects just because you're, you're working on this and you're working on that, you're working on something else, that somehow after a while you can look back on what you've done and you can see correspondences emerge between like these separate works of art that you might have not known that, you know, you may see something in them that you didn't know that you were up to at the time. Is that the case with the, with the study of inequality, that it's emerged out of these, these various prior yeah. projects? Or? Yeah. I mean, the truth is I, I was trying to get out of conflict journalism. I just thought I was sort of fed up drawing certain things. And um, I thought, well, you know, I, 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 want, I did a story about India, as I mentioned. I did a story about African migrants trying to get to Europe. And you realize, in a way, you can't really get away from conflict, because even when you're talking about poverty, that's a form of, there's conflict inherent in poverty, which has to do with social inequality. So you begin to ask yourself some questions, and sometimes, I mean, journalism is useful for pointing things out. It's not, it doesn't always go to the answers of why things develop the way they develop. I mean, it can, it can touch on it in localized forms, but I'm interested, I've become more interested in the species, actually, in, in humanity in general, not like, you know, this nation doing this to that nation or that group of people doing this to this group of people. I'm, I'm interested in all of us. And um, that's why one thing sort of leads to another. And it's not like you're really putting it together. Uh, you're not connecting dots so much, but then things are an outgrowth. Working with Chris on... Uh, social inequality in America, and you wonder why do people take it? Do they push back? Those are the things I'm interested in. I mean, and the thing is, you know, sometimes I do try to get away from even the notion of conflict. I mean, even the genesis of the uh, Mesopotamia book was being asked, you know, I was, I was asked, you know, go to the Louvre and do any, do something about anything in the Louvre. And I thought, well, uh, what I normally skip over is the ancient Near Eastern stuff because nothing, nothing deadens the pulse more than clay pots. And I thought it, it, would, be, it would be interesting to actually do a book about that whole thing. And so I, I, I went to Paris and I went into the, into, the first, into the building and into the room. And the first thing you see is the stele of, it's called the stele of the vultures. And I didn't really know it. So I'm seeing it for the first time, and it shows a um, city leader in a chariot with a spear and an army uh, marching. And this is from like 2300 BC. It's considered the first public uh, monument ever produced that it's, it has a public function. Um, it's like, a, as far as like a government document, mm -hmm. basically, because it has script and writing. And in one of the tiers, because it's like, it reads like, a, it's, it's like a cartoon strip. It has four tiers with words and images. And in one of them, there is a, a heap of bodies. I mean, in fact, when you read the inscription, I, I sort of read it. It's called a tell. It's, it's, a, mo it's a mountain of bodies that this king is dreaming and later he manifests in battle because there's another mound then and I'm thinking you can't get away from it I mean I, I came to to write about first civilization on some level but there it is again that's what it's all about it's about people killing each other for whatever reasons and I'm, I'm very curious about how 
higher, how uh, things are structured that, um, that that happens, that there's an army marching to the orders of a king. And there's ideological reasons, obviously, because over his shoulder is the god who is directing traffic, you know. So all these things make me really curious. And Joe, you live in one of the most progressive cities in America, Portland. Great transit system, Powell's books, you know. Free range of, hens. Yeah, no. and, and I'm, I'm curious what uh, your environment and living in Portland, how that, and even if it does, how it might manifest itself in the type of work you do, or even in your attitudes towards the world. Well, I have to say, I mean, um, it's good to be in a place where you can hear yourself think. And Portland's like that. I mean, I was living in New York, and I loved New York, and I thought I would never leave it. But at some point, you realize, okay, I'm not sure I can draw every day if the night before someone was flying in from somewhere interesting and I hadn't seen them for ages. I mean, New York is a place where everyone's coming through, and you're constantly meeting interesting people and you're sort of always hungover, and you're, you're getting your work. And you're not in Portland. And you're not in Portland. Well, I love New York, and you know, I miss it. I do miss it. But, you know, Portland, maybe like Vancouver, I mean, if, if, you, if you have enough money to live well enough, it's comfortable. And I have nothing against comforts. I wish everyone in the world had them. You know, it's, it's easier to go to a place to know that you can come you know, I'm lucky. There's, there's, always an, there's always been an exit sign anywhere, anywhere I've ever gone that's remotely difficult. I can always leave and go out, and I'm really thankful for that. It helps me to go to a place like Portland to have a quiet place to work, really, and a place where I can not worry about what's going to happen to me on the street. Okay, I'll let you do the final question here, Chris, and then we'll go to... You tapped out? I'm good. Okay. They're tapped out. Uh, it's up to you now. Now, um, I'm Joe Hall is going to go into the audience and seek people with questions. And um, I see a question up here. Can you raise your hand? You said, what issues do you... What issues do you have yeah, what issues do you have identifying as an activist? Well, because, I mean, partly it's that sort of journalistic training where I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to be honest about my work. I definitely have sympathies, and I don't consider myself uh, from the school of the so-called objective journalism, uh, which I question, the, the notion of objectivity. I mean, I think we all come from a, a place, we all come in with prejudices, and you have to sort of recognize that. I mean, Edward R. Morrow said that. You just have to recognize that you have prejudices. Um, I'm all for activism. And I, I've talked, activists help me out in my work. I mean, sometimes they're the people who introduce you to people. But it's that, that thing where, OK, you're, you're, you're there because you, you think these, a, 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 a story should be told. But sometimes you find something that goes sort of against what you've already what you've heard, and you have to be a journalist. To me, is going to be honest about what they're seeing. If you see something that might shoot the activist in you in the foot, you still have to report it. That's that's the difference. That's why I said I want to show people warts and all. Do, do you understand? Do you get what I'm saying? You're not. You're not satisfied. <laughs> and I have no problem I mean I have no problem with activism. Yeah, don't take that the wrong way. I mean I because I do have a lot of respect for activism. In fact there's that part of me that wants to be on the street, you know, completely. And I and I have a feeling my work might shift into activism at some point. Um, but when I'm doing journalism, I think of that in a different sort of way. Okay. Now we have a question up on the right. Hi. Um, I'm visiting from Australia, so... Hi. <laughs> um, I was just interested, because I know you, you 
were born in Australia or you grew up there. Um, for me, reading your um, writing, drawing about um, refugees had a lot of resonance because obviously Australia has a pe pretty outrageously horrible way of treating refugees. And I, I just wondered, is that a subject you would ever revisit? Like how much of your work do you think, like you talked, it's about humans really. Would you revisit that theme but in another place? Because refugees are an issue in a lot of places in Europe as well as Australia. Well, I, I don't know if you saw the piece I did about, because um, I'm from Malta originally, and I, I did a story about African migrants washing up on Malta and how they're treated in Malta, how the Maltese are reacting to them. I mean, I think it's a real important story because I, I, um, I think human migration is probably the story of this century because of climate change and resource scarcity and things like that. It's going to continue to be a big issue. Would I do, it again? Would I do another story about that? I might. Um, the thing is you have to sort of know yourself and um, there's part of me that thinks there's a half-life now that I've reached with certain kinds of stories. It's not that those each individual or each particular story isn't important because I think it is, but in some ways I'm, I feel like I'm not learning. There, there comes a point where you're not learning what you need to learn just to sustain your, your, your interest to go on. You've seen it before in a way. And then there are other questions you begin to think about, like with refugees, you begin to think about the climate. Like, where does this all stem from? You know, I don't want to keep repeating myself in, in, as far as stories go. And the next question here. Um, my question is in regards to uh, the mindsets of uh, people you encounter in, um, you know, third world countries. Um, I would imagine that some people have been, well, they're in certain situations where um, they don't necessarily believe uh, you know, they, they draw towards populist ide ideology, they draw towards, um, you know, uh, provincial thoughts, uh, prejudice, stereotypes. Um, and I'm curious as to uh, how you can see that happen in third world countries and, and how, do, do you have any, any um, perception on, on how we can reconcile that in third world countries with, with the type of people who still support Rob Ford in Toronto, who lived in a, in a first world country, just out of curiosity. Do you know who Rob Ford is? So I don't mean He's to throw a, a, Everyone in the world knows the who Rob Ford is now. He's the crack cocaine guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not 100% sure I understand your question. Is it prejudice within third world communities themselves? Is, um, or No, it, it's, it's, it's just the tendency of, of, of people who have uh, live, live in places where education is perhaps not as available um, to gravitate towards uh, populist arguments to um, have uh, you know occult personalities or sorry uh, per <laughs> I can't say it right uh, cult of uh, gravitating towards certain leaders who use populist arguments um, and in my mind sometimes you can say gee these people have been through war they don't have, uh, maybe they don't have access to, like some of, maybe they're not, some of them are literate. literate. I, I don't mean to be um, dismissive of these people, but I'm just thinking, you know, you live well, in you a country see that. first I mean, world. You see that, but you also see it in the first world. I mean, ideology, ideology is different in all places, but ideology seems to be effective in all places, because you can also have, I know what you're saying, um, you know, people who don't have much, who are promised something, uh, tend, often tend to respond to that. I mean, I think that's also true. Um, it's also true in the, it's tr definitely true in the third world. It's also true in the first world. I mean, there was the ideology of Barack Obama, for example, where there's a promise made and people respond to that message and we're all educated and we don't look at certain things because sometimes we choose not to. I mean, I can speak for myself. Um, at first, I was not, I, I thought this whole idea of um, yes, we can hope, that it seemed really ludicrous 
and, and shallow. But as time went by, when I saw all my friends succumbing to it, I thought, why am I being such a, a grouch about this? Maybe the guy is for real. You know, whenever he said something that didn't, and, and whenever he said something that didn't comply with what I wanted to believe, and sometimes he said things very directly. He was going to, he kept talking about Pakistan and extending the war there uh, during the debates. I, I, I sort of, you know, you sort of justify it to yourself. You, you create your ideology yourself, you know, oh, he's just saying that to win the election. So, ideology exists, it exists for the poor and the uneducated, it exists for the educated, those who, who are smart enough to fool themselves. A question on this side. Um, you mentioned that you many times go to these places and made kind of a research. So um, I'm a graduate student, and I noticed that in many places, uh, the researcher, journalists have earned a bad reputation because kind of instrumentalized uh, the people. So have you feel, think, or think that they the people you interview or the people you research, they felt that way, like an objects? Well, um, I think in some cases they did. Um, you, especially in Bosnia, you, in Sarajevo, as I mentioned, you came across people who, who would tell stories of um, journalists throwing candy at kids to get them to scramble for the candy so they could take pictures. And of course, the famous stories of uh, journalists who would wait at, um, at corners to capture uh, images of people getting shot by snipers. Um, so you're always sort of fighting that. And you, you try not to objectify the people I mean, I, I'm talking for myself. I'm aware, I'm, I'm very aware of uh, sort of the sins of journalists because I, I see them. But I also am aware of journalists who are there for the right reasons or what I, what I consider the right reasons who aren't objectifying, who really do care. And even, even saying that, you always come across people, even among Palestinians who've who just feel like you're there to make money, or you're there uh, to get, it's gonna, do, it's gonna do nothing to help them. And the truth is, when people would say that to me, I never really knew how to answer that question. The direct question, what are you going to do to help this situation, to say, well, I'm going to write the story about this and it, people are gonna read it, in the end, it, it, it used to feel sort of hollow in my own ears. And I've never been able to sort of, um, I've never really lost that, that sort of uncomfortable feeling myself. I personally don't feel like I'm there to objectify, but I often wonder what good I'm doing, you know. <laughs> Does it, it makes me like an activist. Oh no! I mean, if that's if that's the question, if that's your definition of an activist, I'm I'm happy to be, I'm happy to be considered an activist. But I mean, I'm reporting. When I'm reporting, I'm trying to be very honest about what I'm seeing. And sometimes you're hearing things, and you think, this is not going to sound good to a Western audience. But if you hear it once, twice, three, four times, you think, as as an as an honest reporter, then you're going to report it. You know, it doesn't mean that my sympathies aren't the same, but it, there's a nuance to it. Now, a question up here. Uh, yeah, it's a question about really your panoramas and sort of your city. Um, when Where are you? I'm sorry, I can't see you. Oh, oh right sorry. Here. Okay. Um, when you're down in Portland, you really notice that there's a lot of art that involves like panoramas of a lot of people doing things together, and you really notice this because in Vancouver, panorama means like mountains and trees and that's it and 
so when you're at like the foot of Mississippi Street and there's this mural of all of the women who've contributed to the labor movement, you really see, oh yeah, this is a place that really values the, pe the contributions its people have made. And when you say, you know, you're interested in all of us, you know, from New Yorkers are less likely to say that, I think, than Portlanders. So how does your city really kind of inform that, you know, you really obviously are interested in that, like, life's rich pageant panorama of what happens in places. Yeah, that's true. Are you asking how Portland informs that? Yeah. I don't know if Portland informs that, really. I mean, the, the way I look at that art, I think, of, I, I'm not sure. My, I wonder if it doesn't come out of the New Deal and the art that came out of the New Deal, those murals uh, that were financed by taxpayer money where they were getting artists to just paint and they were painting themselves and workers around them. So I wonder if that's sort of a carryover, those murals. But I'm interested in, in the world. I mean, it, it might have to do with, you know, I was born in Malta, I grew up in Australia, I lived in America, I've lived in Europe. It's, it's just like when you travel around, you realize that uh, you're, not, you're not focused on one little place and you realize the world is very fluid and it's very possible to have connection with people who don't have the same background as you. And that's very liberating thought. I mean, sometimes I think that I have a bigger connection to people I have in Gaza than I do with someone who lives two doors away from me. You know, it's like this, the connection among people that uh, is hard to describe. It has nothing to do with the nation state. Now a question up here on my left. Um, as an American expat hiding in Canada, uh, I was struck by the gravity and the truth behind what was painted in Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt. And I'm wondering if, um, you're, you're currently living in America, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or hopes for what is to come of that com country which seems to be sort of rapidly crumbling. Well, that's an interesting way of putting it. Um, <laughs> I think, I mean, it seems, uh, I'm actually very troubled. I'm very troubled by this, the whole surveillance, uh, re all the surveillance revelations. I mean, I'm, I'm glad there have been the surveillance revelations, but um, I worry that, um, I worry, that, you know, I have, I have friends who are Democrats um, who will, basically will trust the current administration because it is the current administration. And, you know, my argument is, well, they're putting something into place that could be used by another administration. You think of Dick Cheney and George Bush, and the same things that are being put in place now and have been put in place under Bush and Obama can be used later to really clamp down. Uh, I was really heartened by the Occupy movement. I was really glad to see there was a pushback. Um, I, I think there is that element too. I mean, I think there's, people are unsettled. People know something's wrong. The whole banking situation, the bankers being bailed out. Like a lot of people, I don't understand a lot of the, the, the ins and outs of it. But you know, you know deep down that there's something really up with that. And the inequality just keeps, it gets worse. So um, I'm troubled like you're troubled. I don't know where it's going to go. Um, I'm very disappointed in the current administration, I'll say that. And now another question up here with the microphone. Uh I just wanted to ask, actually thinking, um, listening to her question, how do you deal with maintaining uh, contact with people after you've interviewed them? Like after the story's done, do you always maintain contact with the people who have told you such personal stories? Or I don't know, just how that process works after you've left the country? Well, I mean, it, it depends on the individual relationship, but um, uh, there's some there's someone in Gaza I still maintain very good contact with. Uh, uh, a lot of people in Bosnia I maintain very good contact with. Um, I don't know if you've read The Fixer. Anyone's read The Fixer here, but uh, Nevin in Paris. I mean, we're in very good contact. I was just in Bosnia again to do a story about Srebrenica, and um, 
I was with my old friend Eden, who is the main character in Safe Area Garajda. We were working together again, and that was great. And I got to see a lot of, went back to Garajda, met some old friends. So whenever possible, I, I try to do that. I mean, it's, but it depends on the individual relationship. Because sometimes I'm trying to keep contact and someone else isn't, or, or I'm the one who drops the ball. So it depends. Now the next question on the front row. Uh, hi, uh, I'm a high school teacher here in BC. We're starting to use uh, some of your books in our curriculum. Is it, is it coming into uh, classrooms in the United States in other places in Canada? Um, and then I also wanted to just sort of add a second thing. People, uh, my kids, when we start studying you, they say, who is this guy? I say, oh, he's, uh, he's like Tintin. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you Tintin. Yeah, but I don't like dogs as much. I'm kind of a cat guy. Um, no, I mean uh, my books are used in uh, in schools, so that's I'm glad. I mean I'm I'm surprised. It's not like you're thinking in terms of. I mean, strangely, I'm not thinking in terms of education when I'm doing my work. I'm thinking in terms of. What did I see? I'm just trying to get down on paper as honestly as possible what I experienced. And if that's used to uh, give people some notion of what's going on in wherever, maybe the Palestinian situation or what happened in Bosnia, then I'm glad. Or at least part of a curriculum, anyway. Okay, another question in the front row. Hi. Uh, hey, Colin. Hello. <laughs> your, your work to me has always been a balance of the autobiographical and the journalistic, and I was wondering how that balance has changed over the years. Well, I think my journalistic work is becoming a little less autobiographical. Um, if you've read my the first book, Palestine, um, you know, I'm a bigger character in that story because the stories are so episodic I'm going, I'm bouncing from one person to another, one situation to another, and I'm the only real thread in the story, so I'm a bigger presence. But then if you look at the, the stuff from uh, Bosnia, I'm a presence, but I think more only because I have to be to bring uh, someone else's story into relief. The characters I met, I follow through the whole book, and so that they are very strong characters. They can hold the book together. And I think the same is true with later work. And in my shorter pieces, I, I won't say I drop out completely, but I'm not much of a presence. Whether that makes it less entertaining or more entertaining or better journalism or whatever, I'm not sure. It's just I'm, I'm not that interested in drawing myself um, unless it's, it, it sort of brings something to relief. For example, the fact that um, people were using me in garage to take letters back and forth to relatives they hadn't seen in Sarajevo in years, or sending money or jeans or something like that. That's interesting. I mean, if I wrote myself out of that story, you, I couldn't do the story. Now, time for three more questions. Three more questions. We'll go to the top. <clears throat> Hi, Joe. Hi. Uh, I'm a journalist, and I have a lot of friends who are foreign correspondents. And one of the challenges I find that they often have is um, they get burned out really easily. Um, and uh, it's just, just a personal toll that being a foreign correspondent in a conflict zone takes on a person. And I'm curious to know if that has any impact on you and if that might be part of the reason why you might be veering away from conflict reporting. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, the woman from Australia asked a question about uh, refugees and all that. And there comes a point where it's actually difficult. Once it becomes really difficult to report the story because it's just plain hard on you, you realize your time is sort of up. And I wonder if I've crossed that point. Um, saying that, um, what is harder for me than reporting is drawing. Because uh, when you're reporting, it, it's, it's sort of, you're, it's sort of a cold profession. Journalism is, is a very cold profession. You're trying to get someone's story, and you're trying to keep them on track. And doing all that makes you very focused in a way that you're, no matter what you're hearing, you could be hearing the worst, the, 
awful things, but you're, you're trying to keep the person on track. So you get the story, and then you go to the next one, then you go to the next one. And I know that adds up. But what's actually harder for me is drawing that stuff, because then you really have to think about it. And it's there's something about journalism that allows you not necessarily not to think about it, but not to feel it, sort of. But when you're drawing, you kind of have to feel it. And I, I think if, if you or your friends experience that, I'm sure you're feeling it just in that moment, too. So uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm, 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 I think I'm over, that, I'm over that hump now where I sort of think, I'm not sure if I can do what I used to do. I never thought I'd get to that point. That's interesting. And question here, this is the second to last question. Do you still read comics? And if so, what are some uh, creators and books you enjoy? The question, I don't know if you heard that one, was do I still read comics? Um, shamefully, not as many as I should. <clears throat> I'm not up on a lot of stuff, unfortunately. I tend to read a lot for work, um, and I'm, there's so much I have to read. For example, this Mesopotamia stuff, I, I know nothing about that, so I'm really concentrating on reading that sort of thing. I often read what is sent to me by publishers. Um, just. A couple of days ago, I bought, I bought uh, Rutu Moden's new book, The Property, because I really like her work a lot. And um, I haven't read it yet, but I'll, I'll read that. And I, brought, uh, I bought Boxers and Sinners, because I've heard good things about it. But again, I haven't read it yet. So things are sort of adding up. I, I wish I had a better answer for the you there. <laughs> Sorry. OK, the final question up here on the right. Uh, hi there. Um, uh, I hope this question doesn't come off as patronizing because it's really not supposed to be. I'm not sure if we caught that first part or not. But um, uh, I, I'm wondering, like, uh, being a journalist who uh, presents it in a cartoon form, has that ever become advantageous, advantageous or detrimental? Like, for example, um, David Simon, when he was uh, doing The Wire, uh, he interviewed a bunch of longshoremen. And at first, they were like, ah, I don't know if I want to tell them, tell them anything. But then he said, I'm making a fiction show. This is not a documentary. And then they kind of spilled everything. Has a similar story come that way, where it's like, oh, I'm a cartoonist, and people like didn't take it? Seriously, you know what it, it, yeah. <laughs> right, well, there was that, um, doing the, the uh, story about the Hague War Crimes Tribunal, there were a couple of people in positions of power who didn't take it seriously. And the truth is, when I first started out, and I was unsure of what I was doing, um, I didn't really know what to say to people. So when I was talking to Palestinians, I would say, I'm working on a journalistic project. It was my way of sort of, being a little fuzzy on what I was doing, because I didn't really know what I was doing, frankly. And I thought they would laugh me out of the, the camp or whatever, you know. But I sort of lost that. Uh, once I got, I got a bit more sure of myself, years later when I was back in Gaza, I, took, I would take the book Palestine with me. And when I was interviewing older people, I would always give them a cop, not I wouldn't, I would, pass them the copy of the book and say, have a look at that. That's what I do. And the reaction was always positive. And the reason I think that is, if I'd given them a book in English and they didn't read English, just prose, it would have mean, meant nothing to them. But the fact that there were pictures, I mean, all humans sort of can relate to images. They could open that up and they could see pictures are drawn years before about Jabali refugee camp and they could somehow recognize themselves in those drawings. So they, they got it right away. Uh, they were kind of, they understood what I was doing. Then when I was asking them very visual sorts of questions, those questions that a prose writer doesn't need to ask, but I need to because I'll have to be drawing a situation, they understood why. They understood why I was drawing a map and saying, where were you sitting and where was the Jeep and where was this and, you know, that sort of stuff that, it would be hard to explain you were doing unless you actually showed them what you were doing. Well, that's wonderful. I'm just going to ask my co-host, Chris Brayshaw, if you have any closing remarks or anything you'd like no to add. No wisdom. Okay. Um, and I want to thank Chris for his contributions and his wonderful knowledge of cartooning and his books. And 
I recommend you go to Pulp Fiction and you can see him behind the, the counter. And I want to thank Joe Sacco for his incredible work. And Thank you. Thank you. And I'd, I'd also like to thank Am Joe Hall for uh, arranging this evening. He, he's, the, he's the maestro. And, and Michael Boucher, who is also plays an instrumental role here at SFU Woodward. So Joe's going to be out in the lobby signing books. And I'm sorry we couldn't take his, all the questions, but we only have the room for a certain amount of time. And then... Joe has to do his work, so uh, I'm very sorry about that, but I really appreciate you all coming out, and you had some great questions, so thank you very much.